In this video, we're going to do the five steps of a hypothesis test when we're dealing with quantitative data. So back when we were doing categorical data, that test was called a one proportion Z test. For quantitative data, we call it a one sample T test. A question on the general social survey asks, how many hours did you work last week? Um, we have 583 men with jobs who were included in the survey, and the mean was 43.5 hours with a standard deviation of 15.3. We're going to assume this sample is representative, the general social survey is well designed, um, and we want to know, do the data provide strong evidence that the average work week for men in the U.S. is different than 40 hours per week? And we're going to set a 5% significance level. So when we state our hypotheses, we always state hypotheses in terms of the parameter, and because this is quantitative data, we're working with the population mean. So we're going to use mu when we state our hypotheses. Um, so one clue that we have quantitative data here is that we're describing the mean and the standard deviation. Um, those are measures to describe quantitative data. The null hypothesis always has an equal sign in it. And the question here is, is it different than 40 hours per week? So the null would be that it's equal to 40 hours per week. The alternative, since it just says different, we don't know in advance whether it's going to be higher or lower, will be not equal to 40. For checking our conditions, we decided in the description that we were going to treat this as a representative sample. Um, so I think that's a reasonable thing to do based on the general social survey. So we're saying that this is representative of all working men. Um, and then we just need to check and see if our sample size is large enough. So our sample size here is 583, so way bigger than 30. So in that case, it's probably not that necessary to look at the shape of the distribution. It should be safe to use a t-test, even if the distribution is a little skewed. Calculating a test statistic, we're going to use the same general formula that we used for categorical data. The statistic minus the null hypothesis value divided by the standard error. So for the statistic here, um, we have quantitative data, so we're looking at the sample mean. That would be 43.5. That's the average work hours in our sample. Minus the null hypothesis value is 40. And for the standard error, we're going to use a new formula. So when we were talking about the sampling distribution, we said that it would be the population standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of n. But but here we don't know what the population standard deviation is. We don't have access to the whole population. So we're going to estimate that using the sample standard deviation. So for the denominator here, 15.3 was our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which was 583. And we end up with a t-statistic of 5.523. Let's pause here and think about what that means. If the t-statistic is 5.523, how would you interpret this value? So the interpretation is actually very similar to what it would be for categorical data. You're thinking about the distance between your sample mean and your null hypothesis value. Um, but you're going to put that in terms of the standard errors. So how many standard errors apart are your sample mean and your null hypothesis value? Notice the problem with choice B. The sample mean is 5.523 standard errors above the true average work week. Um, the problem is that we don't know what the true average is, right? If we did, we wouldn't have to do a hypothesis test. So unfortunately, we can't tell how far away our sample statistic is from the true parameter. The standard error might tell us how far apart they tend to be, but we don't know for this particular sample. So all we can say is that the sample mean, which is 43.5, is 5.523 standard errors above the null hypothesis value. And the null value here was 40. So five and a half standard errors, is that a lot? Um, to answer that question, we have to know something about the distribution of the t-statistics. So since our conditions are met, we know that the distribution of t-statistics is going to be roughly bell-shaped, um, but it turns out that it's not actually a normal distribution. The test statistic t has a sampling distribution called the t-distribution, very creative naming, um, and there's different versions of the t-distribution based on the sample size. Uh, we call that the degrees of freedom. So you take the sample size minus 1, and that's going to be the degrees of freedom. So you can see in this picture here, um, t distributions with 2 and 9 degrees of freedom, they look slightly different. 
but both have that same basic bell shape. So the shape of the distribution of T statistics is bell shaped, but importantly, it is not normal. So we're not gonna use the normal distribution to calculate this, we're gonna use the T distribution. The center of the distribution is still zero, just like a standard normal, um, but the spread of the distribution is slightly larger than the normal distribution. So what that means in terms of the picture um, is that if you look in the tails, the T distributions have more values out in the tails. So here the solid line is the standard normal and the dotted lines are the T distributions. And you can see the T distributions have more values in the tails. The other thing that you can see from this picture is that when the degrees of freedom gets bigger, that like short dotted line, the blue one, is closer to the standard normal. So as the sample size increases, the T distribution looks more and more like the normal distribution. So if your sample size is large, there's actually not much of a difference. So to calculate our p-value, we're going to use the jump distribution calculator like we have before, add-ins, teaching modules, distribution calculator. But the default is normal, and remember this doesn't actually have a normal distribution, it has a t-distribution. So that's the second choice there. And notice that we can change the degrees of freedom here. So the default is degrees of freedom of 10, and you can tell this looks different from a normal distribution, right? Normal goes basically from negative 3 to 3 where a T distribution with 10 degrees of freedom is considerably more spread out than that, right? It goes basically from negative four to four. But let's change it because our sample size was 583, and so the degrees of freedom will be 583 minus one, which is 582. Okay, so now you can see the T distribution with this big sample size that we have, it's really looking more like a normal distribution again, going from negative three to three. So to calculate the p-value, first we change the distribution in jump. So usually it would be um, a normal distribution, but we changed it to a t-distribution. And then we put in our degrees of freedom, which is our sample size minus one. So 583 minus one is 582. And when we did that, we got a distribution that looked more or less like a normal distribution. It was centered at zero, and it basically goes from negative three to three. And the test statistic that we calculated was 5.523. So before we calculate the p-value, pause the video here and make a prediction. Do you think the p-value is gonna be big or small? So if we find our t-statistic on this distribution, we're gonna to have to go out some, three, four, five, five and a half, somewhere out here. So this is our t-statistic, 5.523. And remember, the p-value is measuring the likelihood of getting our statistic or more extreme. So we're going to want to shade out towards the higher end of the scale. This is actually a two-sided test, though, because remember, we had a not equal in the alternative. So we're also going to go out the same distance on the other side, find negative 5.523, and shade to the lower end. But getting values out there is very, very unusual, and so we would expect our p-value to be really small. So to calculate it, I'm gonna put in 5.523, and if I hit enter, this is, doesn't match my picture, right? This is shading most of the graph, and we only wanna shade the very tails. So if it were a one-sided test, a greater than, we would pick this one, um, but this is actually a two-sided test, so we're picking the option down here at the very bottom, and we want to put in two values with the smaller value as value one. So we put in negative 5.523 and 5.523. And as we expected, our p-value is very small. In fact, it doesn't even register here. The p-value it gives us is just less than 0 0.0001. So when we found 5.523 and negative 5.523, and we shaded everything that was more extreme than that, we ended up getting a p-value that was extremely small less than 0 0.0001. So how would you interpret that p-value and what would you conclude? Pause the video one more time um, and give yourself a chance to try to answer these questions.
So first let's think about the interpretation. Remember the p-value interpretation has three parts. It's the probability of getting our statistic or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. So choice C is the interpretation of the p-value as a probability. Um, notice that you want to avoid A and B. Unfortunately, the p-value does not tell us the probability that the null is true or the probability that the alternative is true. So we want to avoid those. And for the conclusion, we have a p-value that is much, much smaller than our alpha. We have an extremely small p-value. So when the p-value is small, that means we have sufficient evidence to conclude the alternative hypothesis. So our p-value was small, so we had sufficient evidence, sufficient evidence to conclude and then we'll write out our alternative in context to conclude that the true average work week for men in the US for men in the US is not equal since this is a two-sided test is not equal to 40 hours per week So when we do a hypothesis test, that's really what we're doing. We're measuring our evidence against the null and for the alternative.